this is uh, the highlight of my day. Even though I ran with Olympic athletes this morning, at Central <laughs> Park, I'm going to say this counts as definitely the highlight of the day regardless. <laughs> Thank you. It is, um, uh, it is a real pleasure to be uh, here with, with Craig. I, I was, we were just talking backstage. Um, when I was very, very young and green, um, 1989, I was working for Nature, and I'd heard a story that a guy at NIH had a gene sequencer. And this was the first gene sequencer, and I just had to see it. I actually didn't even know who the guy was. It was just, there was, I went there to see the machine and went to Rockville, and there was a kind of a converted warehouse, was it, or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and, and there I met, I met Craig, and he hasn't changed a bit. He was, he was <laughs> visualizing at that moment pretty much everything that came to be, um, sequencing supercomputers, thinking of genetics in a, in a new way. Um, and uh, Craig, tell me, that, you know, that, that was 23 years ago. What had you spotted then? And what have you learned since then that was wrong about that initial concept? Well, it's actually interesting looking back. Um, it's actually kind of boring for me because I was remarkably consistent that I whole was time. Thinking. You know, er everything I predicted came true, and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, so it's. Uh, but I, I think the surprise to me is how slow it's taken the scientific community and the rest of the world to catch on to some of these same things, and. As a result, now 12 years after the human genome, genomics is just getting started. You know, it's in the infancy, in part because the scientific community and the science process with understanding genetic disorders hasn't changed. You know, it's the same look at one disease, look under the lamppost versus using all this data that we have. Uh, and now it's cheap. Instead of a, you know, we lowered the price from three billion to a mere hundred million per genome. Mm. Uh, now it's down to around four thousand dollars. And so, doing large numbers, uh, we could do enough genomes for the cost of the original project to actually solve most genetic disorders. Uh, but that will never be undertaken again because it all gets sliced back up into these little tiny pies that don't do anything. So, it's a little tiny, little tiny pieces that yeah, yeah. Uh, you know where people look just at their disease. And the odd things about genetics, it's, it's, it's statistical probabilities. It's mm. not yes, no answers. So it, it's a perfect field for actuaries. Yes. Um, and that's what it'll be used by in the future. And so you have to understand those statistical probabilities and you have to have large numbers to get meaningful data out of it. And without the large numbers and without all the digitized phenotype, um, we're gonna keep crawling forward instead of leaping forward. Did you, did you know that then? And the reason I ask is that what you describe, the notion of probability, the notion that DNA is not destiny, the, the you know, sort of non-deterministic nature of this. When you embarked on this 25 years ago, you get started. I mean, the notion of discovering a gene, you get a PhD yep. thesis for discovering a gene, and you were just gonna, gonna discover thousands of them, and you were going to run through supercomputers, super and you were gonna treat them like big data. This was a radically new concept. Um, at that moment, did you realize what big data was going to mean to genetics, this sort of statistical rather than deterministic? Yeah. It, it, in fact, one of the reasons I left NIH is I tried to get our bioinformatics team promoted as scientists at NIH. And the NIH bureaucracy said, no, these are computer people. Mm. Maybe they can be over in the computer core, but they're not biologists, and that's not biology. And so NIH has been dragging behind because they still haven't truly seen that notion that is large number crunching, that's a large amount of data. Uh, so we had to leave to be able to do the experiment the right way and start building it. So all the breakthroughs that we had, uh, while the technology looks cool, it was all mathematical algorithms mm. and new uh, approaches. Uh, so without the computational part, it would have been an empty gesture. Uh, if uh, advice to a teenager today, computational biology, good, good uh, field to go into? So I get asked this all the time. There's no wrong field to go into. There's just wrong places to go to work. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> let's, let's fast forward. Um, so um, everything you predicted came true, as you say. <laughs> the, um, all the sequencing technology and synthesis technology got faster, cheaper, better. It's now, as you say, 400 $4,000 per genome, and presumably it'll soon be 400 and then, and then 40. Um, you have two institutes right now that are doing just this. 
What's next? Where, where, where do you take this? So I think the, the big advance, you know, and it's more of a conceptual advance than anything else, is what we did with synthetic biology, mm -hmm. which when we read genomes, we're digitizing biology. So we're going from what I call an analog code. People argue with me whether DNA is an analog or a digital code, but I view it as an analog molecule. And when we read that code, we convert it into the ones and zeros of the computer. So could you briefly say why you call it an analog molecule? I, I guess just because it's, uh, it's a physical molecule that uh, you know, is kind of clunky compared to digital information. And, you know, but uh, it's not really digital. I mean, I consider digital the ones and zeros. Um, okay. But people like to argue about that, All right. and I figured you might want to. But there you go. Uh, <laughs> but I hope not. Um, so we've been all this data is ones and zeros, and so the assumption that's gone with this is that DNA is the genetic material, and and people just have ex accepted that, even though it's never been truly proven. So we set out to do the experiment of going the other way, starting with the ones and zeros, recreating DNA rebooting it up to recreate life and showing that every single atom in the cell uh, was controlled or derived from the DNA code that came out of the computer. So now the digital and biological worlds have a complete interface. They're distinct and unique and people, as you know, have been trying for a long time to recapitulate the biological code within the computer and get it to simulate life and that's not going to work. Um, although there's some nice modeling work, the study that came out of the team at Stanford trying to model our minimal cell uh, have uh, a you know, large number of cellular processes where they can uh, track them in the computer. But biological life is truly distinct from digital life because you can get genetic changes in organisms either survive or don't survive, but the ones that survive can go on and do something. And with the computer code, hmm. it's very hard to get that to happen. If you get a, a change, it kills the program yeah. Uh, and then the, the computer dies. So, but the interface allows us now to switch rapidly between the digital world and the biological world. Now, you're referring to the Minimum Genome Project and also synthetic, um, synthetic life. When you talk about, now the synthetic biology is just small, small elements, little, yeah. little, little bits of gene function that, yeah. that's, that, that, that do a particular thing. You're talking about an entire organism. Yeah, synthetic genomics is a, uh, either a subset of synthetic biology or synthetic biology is a subset of that. It's not clear, depending on who you're talking to, but we're dealing with making the entire genome out of starting with the digital code in the computer. In fact, we just finished designing three different versions of a minimal genome that we're about to do the transplants and find out if they work. It's the first time we've designed a, an entire genome in the computer, uh, but it's hard to do because there's still a lot of biology that's unknown. So what you're talking about is designing something in computer, uh, then synthesizing it in DNA, then injecting the DNA into a, 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 an empty cell. A risk, well, it's actually not empty. It's a recipient cell. What happens, as soon as you put the new DNA in the cell, within seconds it starts to get red. You know, hmm. just how our protein robots work. You know, they recognize the DNA, they bind to it, they start copying it, and the proteins start getting made. And some of the early proteins that get made are the restriction enzymes that my colleague Ham Smith discovered and got the Nobel Prize for in 1978. Mm -hmm. So he's 81 and still working at the bench mm -hmm. every day. It's, it's a, a great role model for young scientists. But anyway, these restriction enzymes recognize the chromosome in the cell as foreign DNA and chew it up. So we start with the body of one species and the genetic software of another. And within a very short period of time, the genetic software replaces everything in the cell with proteins made from its instructions. And in a short while, we have a new cell based on that new genetic software, and there's not a single molecule left from the original species. So you completely convert one species into another simply by replacing the software. You know, Mac users wish you could do that just by replacing a software and a PC, right? Indeed. Uh, so then when you say boot up, that's, that's what you mean. Yes. Um, how close to that are we? Well, we can do it. We did it with the first synthetic chromosome that was largely modeled off uh, an existing chromosome. We made a number of changes. Uh, the team devised a whole new code so we can write the entire English language with numbers and punctuation. We put in some quotations and things like that so to prove that it's synthetic. Um, 
we've made these three uh, chromosomes, um, and so if it works, people will know about it soon. Okay. If it doesn't, you won't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just go back to the bench and try another version. Uh, uh, well, we'll have another conversation on the need yeah. to publish negative results. That's but, right. But, but, <laughs> but, I, but I hear you. Um, no, you just keep going until you get positive ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we've been talking um, about uh, advances in gene synthesis. And, you know, we started with gene sequencing. And now, and that's 20, 23, 24 four years ago. And now we're, we're, gene synthesis is also on a Moore's Law-like like approach. Yeah. Um, when you put the two together, you start to imagine a sort of machine that can almost copy life. I, I know you're, you're thinking about this. Now, I, I, Star Trek metaphors quickly kick in, but, <laughs> but tell me what you have in mind. So uh, we, we've developed what we're calling the digital biological converter or biological teleporter. And this is important, for example, sample return from Mars. So we're, we're building a sending unit that we're testing out in the Mojave Desert to, to robotically just take a soil sample, isolate the microbes, isolate the DNA, sequence it, and then send it up to the cloud. And then- Wait, wait, slow down just a little bit there. <laughs> Mojave Desert. Yeah. It's a Mars test site. It's, it's a know. Mars test site. Yes. Robot. Just, yeah. just, just help, me, help me visualize. There's a, there's a machine there. Take it like a Mars robot. Just, like, like, you know, like uh, with any of the robots on Mars, you just take a, a scoop of soil. And at Mars, it's going to have to be subsurface. And so I think life discovery will have to wait till we can drill down below the surface a little bit. It's a question of how far you have to okay. go to get water. But that's one of the upcoming missions. There'll be a drill. I'm with you on the drill part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we have uh, cell sorters, simple robots that can sort things down at the single cell level. And we can do a genome on a single cell. So, so uh, uh, dirt or a soil sample comes through and goes through a bunch of sifting elements in which yeah. you get little tiny particles. And then you have another robot that can figure out which one might be a cell. Or right. it doesn't really matter because you can just, it, there will be DNA life forms there. I, I think there, there will be DNA yes. life forms. You know, when we do this interview in 20 years, you can say, you know, once again, of course, it's can. pretty boring <laughs> now. <laughs> it's a, um, okay. And so we'll just isolate the DNA uh, and sequence it on the spot and send that now digital information. When Earth and Mars are at their closest, it would take only 4.3 minutes to get the, the Martians uh, back to Earth. And a lot of people are concerned with sample return and you know, the Andromeda strain that eats the planet and things. So now we can rebuild the Martians in a P4 spacesuit lab mm -hmm. instead of having them just land in the ocean in a, in a space capsule. And by rebuild the Martians, you mean synthesize? The Resynthesize the genome and boot it up and then have the cells here. So, um, so, so, uh, so we have a sending unit and a receiving unit. Right. So, so uh, this is every step of this. This is not just sequencing on Mars and synthesis yeah. on, on Earth, but also injecting that, se that sequence into a, what kind of cell? A so human we're, cell? So we're trying to create a universal recipient cell uh. where we'll read the genetic code, any type that we put in. Uh, but we're also trying to get a cell-free system. Mm. Um, you know, since the 60s, so Marsha Nuremberg was one of the first to use just cell-free uh, ribosomes uh, with protein synthesis. And he was one of the first, he and Corona were first to use synthetic DNA, and that's how the genetic code was worked out. They made poly A, poly U, mm -hmm. and then read out the protein sequence from what they got. So it's, it's 50, 60-year-old technology, but all you have to do is make the DNA, you can drop it in uh, one of these uh, little pots you can buy uh, in a kit and make any protein. DNA itself is infectious if you're making a phage like phi x 74 and all you have to, and that's the first thing we made, we just made that genome, you put it in E. coli, E. coli starts reading it, makes the viral proteins, they self-assemble, form the virus. So once you can get to DNA, all life is, is within the realm of possibility. So now we have a cell producing proteins, then what? So, um, you know, for the cell-free system, the, the, the goal would be to get all the components there, uh, enough lipid concentrations to form my cells, and also the phospholipid uh, pathways being produced from reading the genome, that we just spontaneously get cell formation and get life. It's, it, it will happen, it's a question of how fast it happens. 
Maybe we should bring up a slide that shows some of the machinery okay. on this. I'll push a button and... So, what so, part, of the, which part yeah. of the machinery is this? So, Roger Laskin at the Veterans who developed uh, this process. Uh, this is a, a self-sorting device for sequencing single cell genomes. And uh, this has been done for, um, we can sort out single bacterial cells and, and actually do the genetic code on a single cell. What we're using it for with human genomics is to get separating uh, the chromosomes from the parents. And the way we do this it, uh, is we can sequence single sperm cells. Uh, so everybody I assume knows that sperm is just uh, half the genome. Mm -hmm. um, but every sperm is different, you know. Parents are stunned their kids come out different. Um, every single sperm is different and every single egg is different. And there's on an average of one crossover per chromosome per sperm cell, but all in different places. So what I say is we, you know, we have to sequence a handful of sperm um, cells. And by just doing several genomes on single cells, we can get a complete separation of the uh, haploid genomes to get the full diploid genome. So, and it's very important in the future of genetics is to understand the exact gene changes you inherited from your mother versus your father. Mm. And there's a, something that's largely been ignored in genetics because they couldn't do it, and it's looking at compound heterozygotes. That's where you get one set of gene changes uh, from your father and the same gene, a different set of changes from your mother. And it creates variants that uh, were not part of the repertoire of most geneticists to even think about. Hmm. And it turns out one of the advantages or disadvantages of being first to have my genome done and on the internet is people keep doing studies around the world and publishing all the diseases that I'm dying from. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, you apparently, I, you know, the news is they haven't realized I'm not going to die from those childhood diseases. Ah. Uh, <laughs> But uh, now with the compound heterozygotes, it's narrowing it down uh, where we can get 100 or so major gene variants that could be of significance. But the could be is, you know, gets back to the probability things of, um, you know, if you have a greatly increased risk like I do for Alzheimer's disease, uh, what doesn't show up is why people with the same changes don't get Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. That's why you can't look at just one gene and say you will get breast cancer based on this information or you won't get breast cancer. It's just probability statistics with other genes and the rest of the genome and your environment uh, playing a role as well. So this is a very cool device that separates cells and we can do, uh, this is mostly based right now on looking at stem cells. Mm -hmm. So we have a stem cell genome project where we're looking at the genetic changes in stem cells because it doesn't matter whether they're embryonic stem cells or iPS stem cells, as soon as you take the cells out of the human body, the genetic code starts to change. Mm. First you lose methylation and regulation, and then you get these changes. So for stem cell therapy to be effective, we need to sequence the genome and then go in and correct mm. the defects in the stem cells uh, before you put them back in. And so I'm, I've been studying this more as a patient advocate because there's labs in La Jolla looking at my brain cells and tissue culture made from skin IPS cells. And, I just got an email yesterday, we're making your liver. Um, but, but I don't want these cells put back into my brain, or, you know, because there's so many oncogenes that have been activated uh, just from this taking them out of the human body. So cell-to-cell -cell contact is important. So it's an awesome machine that Roger Laskin developed. And back to the, the teleporter metaphor, this is the, this is the Mars side. Well, this, this would be the, the sorting side to get down to single cells. Uh, Initially, we don't have to do it. That was the whole basis of how we discovered the microbiome mm. in the ocean environment is we can just take all the DNA, sequence it, and use the computer to deconvolute all the information. So we just need the sequence data. There could be 10,000 Martian organisms in that soil sample. Right. We just get the data back and we can reconstruct the different species out of it. Okay, so now you, you send the data to Earth, and let's do the next slide. Um, and then, so it, it goes into digital data. Yes. And then we convert back. Yeah. So we then start with four bottles of chemicals, and this is just a miniature, miniature is a relative term. Pretty soon, you know, people just have a small box linked to their computer, and you could download uh, a new vaccine uh, from the internet, uh, insulin, growth hormone, if you're an athlete. Um. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's only like an Olympic be. athlete, right? It's, uh, um, <clears throat> and so this takes four bottles of chemicals and writes the genetic code. And then we have robots that assemble the DNA to make the whole chromosome. And then once you're at that stage, you can drop it in a pot to make proteins. You can boot up a phage or a virus, or we can make now simple uh, self-replicating bacterial cells. So this is a 3D printer for DNA? Yes. Or a 3D printer for life. For life. Um, and let's imagine that day where it does become small and cheap and, and, and easy to use. Um, and I have one on my desktop, or everyone does. First of all, why? Why would we want one? Me, uh, you well, the most important thing is you want really good antiviral software, because yeah. people could send you real viruses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you want to be able to screen out what you're printing. Um, but with H1N1, it took nine months uh, to get the vaccine out. Mm. 250,000 young people died in the US from H1N1. People think there was really no pandemic but because people under 30 had no prior exposure to these antigens, uh, it affected young people instead of people over 30. And we've been working with BARDA and the US government and Novartis. Uh, we now have a version of the digital biological converter. BARDA sends us a test pandemic flu sequence. Uh, we have less than 24 hours to make the new uh, vaccine. And, we now have it down to under 12 hours. It's about 10 hours. And so we're now building one of these versions in North Carolina at the Novartis vaccine plant. So basically, as soon as a new pandemic strain is discovered, mm -hmm. we make, uh, you know, digitally design what we're making. It'll go right there. The converter will convert it, and they can scale up making vaccine for the world. But we have this multi billion dollar plant just trying to make doses for the US. And people might remember that you, you were either on the priority list or you yeah. weren't for getting vaccine. Um, if you have one of these devices on your computer, you're on the priority list. In one second, we can send this information around the world digitally, and you'll just download the vaccine and inject it yourself, and there will be no more pandemics. So, so um, uh, this week, I took my kids to get their flu shot. Now, this flu shot is a guess. At, at what at what the you know the, the the virus will be come flu season. Well, it's more than a guess, but it is a bunch of old men sitting in our room making a decision, not using Ahead sequence of information. Right, and and also before before that that pandemic or before the viral yeah. flow happens. Yeah, but we we've, we've now changed that as well. We my institute is one of the major centers for sequencing the virus from around the world. And we're developing an algorithm to predict the genetic changes. Mm. Uh, NIH has funded us to make synthetic components of every virus that's ever been sequenced. So it's a matter of a very short time of hours to assemble any new vaccine uh, as it appears. So we're designing it so we will have vaccines built and tested before WHO even sits down at the table to try and make a decision. It could be tested and distributed. Yeah. And if you have one of these conversion boxes, you won't even care what WHO says in the future because you'll have the latest digital information and you'll just download it and have it. So the scenario is rather than at the beginning of flu season, we get one shot. What will happen is in, your, in this scenario, when I have one of these, we'll get an encrypted email from the doctor saying, um, hey, we've got a, we got a, new, a new one um, um, out, um, generated. You get a little vial of something um, out of this machine. The kids then sniff it at breakfast and they're up to date. Maybe they yeah. do it multiple times over yeah. the season. No, there, there is a, an inhaled version, and there's an injectable version. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not clear which depends on whose proprietary information we can get used. Uh, one company has the uh, inhaled uh, vaccine that's metamune. So. so I have to ask, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, we get a lot of spam email. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are making fake drugs and selling them for profit. I mean, it's a nasty world out there where people get fooled all the time. So you'd want some kind of clear-cut validation that, you know, the email came from a bona fide source that you, is reliable. And that, that gets tougher and tougher. I mean, people, you know, I get these emails. They look like they come from American Express, and that's some fraudulent front someplace. And... It, and it even gets problems because you try and block that email, and then it blocks the real email, and you get behind in your bills. And you know, it's a, uh, so you know, it's a problem with the internet as a well. whole. How do you get reliable information? 
And when biology is just as another form of digital information, this becomes critical. Mm. But the fact that it's digital is critical. When, when H1N1 started breaking in Mexico City, I got a call from the mayor of Mexico City. Can we, you know, could we work with them to sequence it quickly? And then international politics intervened, and they were never able to send the actual virus out of Mexico City. But if they just sequenced it there on the spot with one of these rote devices, it could have gone around the world digitally, and people could have started studying it and making new vaccines for it. So it can change the practice of medicine by having it be digital information very quickly. This, this one says synthetic genomics. Do you intend to make and sell these? Yes. Will you be allowed to? Um, of course. <laughs> it's a question what you can download and do with it, right? So, so you, you think that, you think that uh, regulators um, won't have a problem with uh, gene factories or little distributed life manufacturing on it, our desktop? It, it, it's going to be an interesting form with all 3D printing, you know, but all manufacturing is going to go to distributed manufacturing. Medicine um, has to go that way. You know, pharmacies will become a thing of the past. It'll be all just digital information, and you'll either have one of these things that does chemistry or makes DNA and, and creates everything from it. And the only cost in the future will be the cost of the 3D printer, mm. uh, which you're getting pretty cheap already. You, you said you have one on your desktop. I, I and, do, uh, yeah. Uh, one of our board members has three in his house. I, I don't have one yet. We're making a biological one. That's more fun, you know, uh, than making keychains or something right now. So, uh. <laughs> Do Dollhouse furniture in our house. A lot of dollhouse furniture. <laughs> I agree. That's a little more impressive. So, you know, so regulation is going to be an interesting aspect of this. And how do you get, how do you get accurate certified information versus bogus information? We have just a few more minutes before we get to the questions, but I want to move to, um, to energy and, okay. and, your, and, your, and your work with, uh, with, with algae and, um, and, and, and biofuels. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the, you know, the big commercial aims of, of, of your work has been to to find new sources of energy and to modify algae to be more productive. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been tough, um, and uh, maybe you could just briefly bring us up to speed and then talk about what you think is going to be the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the single thing you can do that'll make you know, biofuels uh, viable um, yeah. from a genetic perspective. Well, and, and Chris and I talked about this ahead of time. It has nothing to do with biology. It has totally to do with government policy. Mm. And without a price being on carbon and having a carbon policy, biofuels are dead. That there is no future in biofuels whatsoever. Um, because if biofuels ever get to be successful, it will cause oil prices to drop and oil prices will fall and, and kill off the biofuel industry once again. Can, can you just stop for a second and explain why that is different? Uh, so one could say the thing, same about solar or wind yeah. or anything else. Why biofuels in particular? Are they so vulnerable? Well, I think it's alternate energy in, in total. You know, um, it, it seems to be a political debate whether uh, all this carbon we're accumulating in the atmosphere has any validity or not. It's one of these... You know, we're really playing Russian roulette, only there's only one empty chamber instead of six, five empty mm. chambers, right? Mm. And, and for some reason, we're a little bit crazy with this. You know, the climate is changing, the environment's changing, and it's clearly due to taking carbon out of the ground, burning it, and putting it in the atmosphere. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, mm. not even genome science. It's just simple, you know, it's like uh, President Clinton said, it's arithmetic. <laughs> yeah. um, and so we have to find a way to change it until we put a real price on carbon. Nobody's going to make any changes. You know, it's, it's too tough for people on an individual basis for some reason to make these changes. You know, I'm one of seven billion people on the planet. What I do doesn't really matter. But it does. Anything you multiply by seven billion becomes a really big number. You know, you get seven billion of these out there every day. Uh, that's a lot of plastic, a lot of trash. So we're trying to use engineering to use CO2 as the raw material. We're trying to use sunlight as the energy source, but there's other, you, know, you can get it directly or indirectly. Sugar is a sunlight driven energy source. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to replace the plastic in bottles with plastic made from either sunlight and CO2 or sugar uh, and CO2. Um, but these are long processes. It's because we have to modify something that hasn't really changed in three and a half billion years, and that's photosynthesis. And I think you have a slide on it. We, yeah. We've finally gotten a breakthrough where we've modified photosynthesis and improved the efficiency for the first time. 
and uh, I don't know how that well this shows up. Both these are the same density of cells. Uh, the problem with uh, what happens is uh, cells, as the light decreases, they get bigger and bigger antennas, they get darker colors, and it shades uh, everything below. So you can only get photosynthetic effects in this very thin layer. So you, so you have a, a surface layer, but you basically, it doesn't matter how much water you have, it matters how much surface area you have, and there's just not enough surface right. area to right. generate the energy. And so depth is important. Yeah. And uh, so we've made a, uh, we've altered uh, the photosynthetic process, and so we have uh, the, the lighter color on the right has three times the photosynthetic efficiency as the one on the left, but it's the opposite of what people thought. You know, people that, well, you want more photosynthesis, you need bigger antennas and mm. more light gathering. We've actually decreased the antenna size and improved the efficiency by a couple of other changes. So these cells, obviously, the light can penetrate a whole lot further and, and we have about three times the photosynthetic efficiency. And this is just one of the multiple baby steps along the way to get there. I think we have another uh, one that, so that. So it just, just shows yeah. graphically what it would mean is the light would penetrate further and therefore you get a lot more photosynthetic effect and more energy captured from sunlight. So people have argued there's not enough photons Actually, it's not a problem with the number of photons. It's the depth that you can go in anything. And you, you can either uh, go down uh, uh, a couple feet or you have to cover more surface area. And then mm. the surface area creates more evaporation and just becomes uh, uh, unwieldy. So th this is a baby step in the right direction. Uh, and, and where do you stand now competing with, with, uh, with fossil fuels? I mean, in terms of... You know, dollars or it, it, it's nowhere dollars. close. Nowhere close. You know, it's, uh, this is one of those areas that needs another five, maybe even ten years of these kinds of breakthroughs cumulatively adding up, mm. and then you know, it, if it gets to the levels we're talking about, it starts to change the whole picture of agriculture, not just fuel production, but corn. You can only get about 18 gallons of oil per acre per year. With the cells we already have, we're up around 4,000 gallons per acre per year. Our goal is to get up around 15,000 gallons per acre per year. So oil palm is the most productive plant, and it's around uh, six or 700 gallons per acre per year. So if we go up in the thousands, this becomes the farming of the future, and we replace agriculture with things that are 10 times or more productive than anything we have right now. So it'll change food, it'll change fuel, it'll change making plastic bottles. But you described you need two breakthroughs. You need political breakthroughs in price and carbon, yeah. and then you need scientific breakthroughs to, yeah. can you just list one or two sort of things that stand in your way scientifically? Well, I mean, it's, it's the whole, you know, we're trying to overcome three and a half billion years of evolution where cells evolve to survive in these environments. And in fact, if cells did what we want them to do, the ocean would be full of lipid yes, instead of water. So we don't want these cells out in the environment. We want them in enclosed facilities where they make a huge amount of lipid uh, instead of what they normally do. You know, 40% of our oxygen comes from these organisms, so we don't want to mess them up or we'll have to go to Mars sooner. <laughs> We probably should take uh, questions uh, from the audience now. There's, uh, as, as you know, the, uh, we'll take them um, hands up in the audience, and there's a mic. Oh, wait for the microphone. We're also going to be getting questions from Twitter. So um, I will take one question from Twitter first. Um, let's take the next question first. Could you back up? Um, uh, uh, yeah, so. Um, Actually, I don't think I understand um, <laughs> that question. Uh, this is a, a Twitter problem, 140 characters. It turns out to be insufficient to ask yes. important <laughs> scientific uh, questions. Um, yeah, let me tweet a different one for you. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think I'm going to suggest uh, uh, the, the one question is about how uh, the WHO and other authorities feel about your relatively radical um, concept about distributing vaccines? Well, it, it's not clear yet. It's a pretty new idea and it's not out there. But I, I would think WHA should be excited about anything that has a chance of eliminating pandemics uh, to really, uh, you know, be excited. So, about. so I, that's uh, my optimism. With, with my, with my, uh, in my history with you, I realized that, uh, that your sense of what large institutions should do and what they <laughs> do do are not always the same. Um, you have faced institutional opposition your entire career. Um, is anything changing? I, you know, s s slowly, but way too slowly. You know, mm. it's, uh, you know it, it's even looking back at the history of science. Um, so I had the 
the honor and privilege of giving the Schrodinger lecture uh, 68 years after he gave it initially on defining what is life. And looking back, it, you know, the big experiment that proved DNA was a genetic material happened two years before I was born. And basically, prejudice and bias in science affects things just as much as it does every other field. You know, scientists are human too, but there's no reason we couldn't have known that DNA was a genetic material in 19. 06 when people were studying Drosophila chromosomes, right? But the bias was DNA was too simple of a molecule. Proteins were more complex, therefore protein had to be genetic material. That notion delayed the discovery for 50 years. So bias and prejudice and narrow thinking has been part of institutional science forever. And so it takes a while for new ideas to get out there and change people's thinking and change approaches. And that's been the history of discovery from the beginning. And it's, you know, maybe it's good because only real things get promoted to the next stage, but it's a frighteningly slow process at this new age of the digital world. Indeed. Uh, let me take a question. Um, we have one in the back, and then we'll get one in the front, and I'll take one from Twitter. Yes, sir. Yeah, John Madison, Kaiser Permanente. The question uh, is, in large-scale software systems, millions of lines of code, whenever we introduce a new code release anywhere in that uh, ecosystem of code, uh, the chances are there'll be some unintended consequences somewhere else, and testing and preventing those unintended consequences is really difficult. So my question for you is, what can we learn from uh, DNA about complex uh, system management that might apply to software implementation, and what can we learn, learn from our software experience about uh, manipulating DNA? Well, that's a great question, and we go back and forth with the metaphors all the time. The DNA code has to be a lot more accurate. When we made the first synthetic cell, um, it was 1.1 million letters of genetic code, uh, orders of magnitude bigger than anybody ever made with DNA before. And we were so sure it was going to work, we booted it up and it didn't work. And so we have to do what software engineers do. We, had, we actually developed biological debugging software to find out what was wrong with our code. And we actually found there was one base deletion in an essential gene. So one letter being wrong in an essential gene is the difference between life and no life. Uh, one letter being different in the flu vaccine could be the difference between having the right antigen and the right protection versus uh, causing a new pandemic. So, uh, accuracy is really important to not have unintended consequences and to have the consequences that you want. So uh, the accuracy of DNA sequencing, even with the, all the new instrumentation, is still not up to diagnostic quality yet uh, for human sequencing. So all this talk constantly about we're going to recreate uh, Neanderthals like we don't have enough. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and other species from, from the genetic code is just fallacy because it's so inaccurate. Mm -hmm. you know, so we have to have really uh, pristine quality data and you want to make sure at the other end the receiving units uh, can recapitulate that in a good form. So the challenges are not trivial. Question here, please. As sequencing equipment becomes more widely available, um, what do you see as the potential for um, the protections necessary for people's privacy, legal considerations, as this equipment and this information becomes, you know, easily accessible from by anybody. Yeah, I, it, that's always been the concern from the beginning of genetics and genomics, and and I sort of broke that mold by putting my genome on the internet, and since then that sort of became the trend, and now everybody does it. And because what we talked about earlier, there's, we're dealing with statistical probabilities with your genetic code, not absolutes, although there are a few absolutes that, that do become important with some diseases. Um, I, I don't think it's a real concern. Uh, privacy with medical information is a fallacy. If, it would be very easy to get all your medical information and anybody's medical information. So it's a relative privacy versus any absolute privacy. Um, and if everybody's information's out there, it becomes part of the collective that helps to understand it, that gives you more information about your own genome and how to have a preventive medicine paradigm. So I'm obviously not concerned about it. The, the biggest danger is if other people have digital biological converters, you know, my genome's been broadcast into outer space mm -hmm. now for 12 years 
people are worried they might come back and lots of Craig Venters come back and <laughs> take over the planet or something. So, so you may wish there was more privacy. <laughs> I mean, I, I want to make sure I understood it. When you said that, <laughs> that, that, that people's health information is easy to get, do you mean that their existing records are easy to crack or that, or that I you know, can simply you know, shake her hand and, and, and get what I need from the sample? Uh, well, all, all, all the above. I mean, just from the coffee cup or the bottled water, we could decode your genome. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the notion, you know, th th there was this really dumb argument we had to fight early on when we were doing the genome is that uh, you had to protect the identity of the people whose genome you were sequenced. There's no more identifying information about you than your genome. <laughs> I mean, it's the ultimate identifier. So you think by leaving off 10 digits of your name or your social security number, somehow you're protected. Uh, you could deconvolute anybody's genome just uh, from a piece of paper, from a coffee cup. And so I think we need a different type of dealing with the information versus secrecy being the presumed protection. Understood. I'll take one more question from uh, Twitter and then we'll uh, take that question back there. Um, one of the questions was how, do, how can other people, uh, how can the general population participate? Do you do crowdsourcing or, or any kind of uh, public, even gamification you know, um, involvement in your research? Well, um, I mean on the policy side it's really critical and we constantly try to, with discussions like this, force a public dialogue. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, before we made the first attempts even at a synthetic virus, you know, we had a, uh, a long bioethical review that was on the University of Pennsylvania that was published in Science in 1999. Mm -hmm. The Sloan Foundation has been funding my institute along with MIT and the Washington think tank to look at security issues. And in, in 2010, when we announced the first synthetic cell, the Obama uh, administration asked the new bioethics commission to take this on as their number one issue. So I think the public dialogue about this stuff is really critical to help understand these issues about, you know, is privacy important? Uh, because it's not just your genome. We didn't have time to talk about the microbiome, but you know, we briefly, have briefly million defined. genes. So the microbiome is, we have 100 trillion human cells, but you have 200 trillion microbes associated with your bodies. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how often you wash your hands, it's not gonna solve that problem. In fact, it's essential for life. Um, and so we have roughly 22,000 human genes. We have 10 million microbial genes in our bodies. And they determine whether you get uh, fat, whether you get diabetes, all kinds of different diseases. And so understanding the microbiome and being able to replace it after we wipe it out by taking massive doses of antibiotics is going to be key for a healthy life. And I presume that our microbiomes differ even more than our genomes differ. Yes. and they they change in part based on the environment. So soldiers living in the desert for a year, uh, their whole uh, mouth uh, microbiome changes out. Mm. Um, but it's been known for a very long time, H. pylori is the, the bacteria that causes ulcers and stomach cancer. You can find uh, relations between people by whether they share the same strain of H. pylori uh, more than they share anything else. So. Um, microbes tell us a lot about our lives and where we're going. So it's going to be getting your genome done and getting your microbiome done are going to be essential uh, starting points in life that we need to track uh, throughout life and, and understand how to change it intelligently. A question in the back there. Could uh, take the microphone to him, please? Thank you very much. I got, I got to admit, I'm scared of you, Craven. <laughs> It's remarkable. Stand up so I can see who you are. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I'll tell you why I'm a toxicologist. That's why I'm <laughs> can you please comment on the potential value to clinical medicine of the metabolome, the proteome, and the exhaled breathome in comparison to the genome, which I sort of see as the toolbox at the front end, and these other big data projects are sort of the finished painting or the current painting? Yeah. Well, this will be the last question. Okay. Uh, so even though it seems like things are getting more and more complex, I mean, they are, but that's what makes me optimistic that we can actually get to reasonable answers. So we know the human genetic code. Uh, now we can find out individual variants in that. We know there is this thing called the microbiome with uh, 10 million or so additional genes. We know the impact that they have on metabolism. So 
Right now, instead of a few chemicals going through your bloodstream, you have about 500 chemicals. Uh, 50 of those are made from bacteria and metabolites of what you eat and, and human chemicals. So we have all these variant components that now measuring them for the first time. If we do large numbers, and it's the value of the large numbers, yet yeah, we need at least 10,000 genomes, 10,000 uh, complete phenotypes on those same people, just doing more genomes is basically worthless. If we don't have complete digitized phenotypic information, all the microbiome data, all the chemical data, all the clinical history to go with it, it doesn't mean anything. But if we put all that together, then we start to get uh, uh, information that will change how we practice health. It becomes a preventative medicine paradigm versus like we're trying to do with the environment. Once we wake up, you know, we can try and save it. But a lot of things, uh, by the time you wake up, you're close to dead. So the simple answer is how people can participate is you don't just need 10,000 sequences. You don't need 10,000 people's genes. You need them to reveal their entire That's right. phenotype, but basically everything about, about them, their life, their history, their family, et cetera. Yep. You need 10,000 volunteers who will put it all out there. Yep. And, and there's more than enough people that want to do that. So it's a matter of getting it done. Doing the genome is, is very easy. Trying to work out what a standardized human phenotype is and how to digitize that in a meaningful fashion is the, probably the biggest challenge for the medical community. All right. Well, you have your, uh, your opportunity here to be one of the 10,000. Uh, please join me in thanking Craig <laughs> Bender.